with us. So we'd like to launch a really quick poll, and I'll ask Natasha just to load this for us. Uh, what we're wanting to know is, are you currently connected to a Cities Reducing Poverty member roundtable uh, or not? So we'll just give you, you know, about 15, 20 seconds to vote, uh, send in your response, either yes or no, and then we will show the results. Okay, it looks like so far near 80% of our folks are not Cities Reducing Poverty members and about 24% are. 75, 25. Beautiful. So it looks like there's a good number of you who are not part of the network on the line. Thank you so much for coming to learn a little bit more about our Cities Reducing Poverty Shared Evaluation. Um, this is really kind of a, a, an example of a way to do shared measurement. And this webinar is less so kind of the general sense of how do you do it. So um, just going to the next slide, we do have a couple of downloadable materials in the handout section in your go-to control panel that I would encourage, uh, especially those of you who are new to the, to the idea of the network and our, our common evaluation, um, would encourage you to download these and potentially read them after the presentation today. There is a bit of a, a backgrounder on the Cities Reducing Poverty Common Evaluation Framework. Um, there's an outline also on an aspect of our, of our shared evaluation framework. Oh, just go back one more slide, Natasha. Back, there we go. An outline about our Sustainable Livelihoods Framework and then also a, a report on um, the first phase of our work in vibrant communities uh, from 2002 to 2012, which Mark Kavaj is a, a, a very much a part of, uh, and then a report just on uh, what were the learnings from that phase of the project. So moving on, um, just a bit of background around cities reducing poverty. I know those of you who are already familiar will know that um, this work really started 13 years ago as an action learning experiment called Vibrant Communities. And, and the aim was to understand if a place-based approach could move the needle on poverty. And over 10 years of work, um, 13 trail builder partners, we call them, uh, cities, worked to lift over 200,000 households out of poverty, which really kind of yielded the question then for us, if 13 cities can have such a huge impact on reducing poverty in Canada, then what was the potential impact if we scaled things up, right? And so the second phase of vibrant communities, known as Cities Reducing Poverty, uh, came into being in 2012. And it's a collective impact movement with the aspiration to reduce poverty for 1 million Canadians through aligned poverty reduction strategies at the municipal, provincial, territorial, and federal levels, um, and through connecting 100 cities together who are doing that local work on the ground. So I'd like to move on and just introduce you to our guest speaker, our very good friend, Mark Kabaj. Um, Mark is actually the former executive director of Vibrant Communities and the former vice president of Tamarack between the years 2002 and 2011. And Mark is now operating his own company from here to there consulting in Edmonton. Um, Mark's current focus is on developing practical ways to assist groups to understand, plan, and evaluate policies and programs and initiatives that address complex issues. Um, issues and challenges like sustainable uh, uh, neighborhood renewal, um, poverty and homelessness, community safety, educational achievement and health. Um, and he's particularly focused on expanding the ideas and practice of developmental evaluation, which is a new approach to evaluation which emphasizes learning and design thinking in emerging and sometimes really fast moving environments. So Mark has been consulting with us um, in vibrant communities as part of our Evaluation Wisdom Council for the past year. Uh, and on our Vibrant Community Shared Evaluation in particular. And we're really glad to have him here on the line today to talk with us about how we're going to be evaluating our impact across the country going forward. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Kirsty and Natasha. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So diving right in. So Mark, I know before we get into the conversation about what this should common evaluation framework looks like, I'm wondering if we can just take a step back for those people who are on the line um, who are new to this approach. Um, or new members to the Cities Reducing Poverty Network, just to contextualize what, a little bit of what we're doing, because evaluation as a national network isn't new to vibrant communities. We've been doing this for a while, um, but there's certainly a lot of history that relates to the conversation today. Yep. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, I, I, you touched a little bit um, on some important parts of the context in which we're working by speaking about the, the history of vibrant communities. So when we began in 2001, it was actually pre-collective impact days. It sounds hard to, uh, it's hard to believe it was a pre-collective impact 
day in our lives, given how popular the, uh, the concepts are now. But we, in 2001, uh, pulled together a number of people who we uh, found were relentlessly dissatisfied with our inability to move the needle on poverty, working in organizations and trying to scale up programs. And we had had a lot of those connections through our previous life, working in the field of community economic development. And we had run this um, experiment in Waterloo, Ontario, called Opportunities 2000, where we tried to uh, see if we could reduce poverty to the lowest levels of Canada uh, in that region. And wasn't uh, all that dramatic because we were the second lowest at that point uh, in, in that decade, but it was still an ambitious effort, which in retrospect we would call a prototypical collective impact effort. So when Vibrant Communities came together in 2001-2002, uh, uh, it was really the first major plank of the Tamarack Institute, whose job it was to help people you know, come up with new ways to solve complex issues. And it was really a hypothesis, a big, big idea, a big question. Could we reduce poverty with a, a new, more ambitious approach where we actually didn't know what it was? We didn't have our own uh, frame of reference, but we came up with, uh, with the following five principles. Could we shift from focusing on symptoms, individual symptoms, to comprehensive action on root causes? Could we uh, move from working in organizational sectoral silos to multi-sectoral collaboration? Could we move from this idea that all one has to do is plan the work and work the plan and fund spun some kind of uh, silver bullet and shift into a learning and experimentation mode and that was number focusing on what was wrong with our communities to focusing on the assets we had to uh, weave together to do something about poverty and finally the biggest one uh, could we move from a focus on alleviation of poverty to one of actual reduction to moving the needle and so uh, when we this is important Kirsty because when we got together uh, the it we were trying to evaluate um, was not yet clear. We had five principles, but we didn't know what they looked like in practice. We had a couple of case studies like Waterloo, but evaluation was designed primarily to help inform the development of what we would eventually call the VC model. So uh, for 10 years, evaluation was used across the 13 sites, it was 15 at one point, to actually ask what kind, what, how are you manifesting these principles? What kind of results are emerging? What are your new insights? And are there any patterns emerging across those sites? And in fact, uh, over the 10 years, every two or three years, we come up with a new series of reports. We found that patterns did emerge. And lo and behold, uh, we far exceeded our original goal of helping 5,000 people exit poverty to um, final, the final number assisted was, I, I don't have the, the, the precise number, but it was in the field of uh, 180,000 with uh, significant um, innovations in strategy at the programmatic level and at the systemic level. So Kirsty, that that's important and you might uh, want to um, ask a couple probing questions here, but cities reducing poverty is built on what we learned on vibrant communities, how those five principles might work, which we would now might even call collective impact principles. Right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. And those principles are still very integral to our approach now, um, particularly the fact that we are trying to not only alleviate poverty, but to actually reduce poverty. Exactly. I think what the idea was, the experiment was relatively successful. And even though while we were wrestling with uh, how well we thought that experiment played out in terms of the evidence, uh, w way ahead of us, there was people already calling themselves vibrant communities and creating demand for a much expanded network beyond the 13. So uh, cities reducing poverty uh, really was in response to a lot of local demand for other pe people to participate in this, this uh, approach to poverty reduction, which is John Kanye, I'll steal one of his phrases from FSG, uh, the vibrant communities model or approach wasn't really counterintuitive, but it was countercultural in that people didn't operate that way, but simply framing it the way we did was really inviting and accessible to a lot of organizations and people working that way anyways across the, the country. So that, just to summarize that, uh, Kirsty, phase one evaluation was used to inform the development of a rough VC model where we understood the general principles, we actually understood some common patterns of practice, and we also had a pretty good understanding where the practice diverged because you can imagine all those different cities worked in very different contexts and we were always wondering what is the it of the VC model and what parts have to be open to local variation. So the, the, there's lots that is inherited from VC1, but VC2, uh, Cities Reducing Poverty, is really focused on expanding that network and achieving an even more ambitious target. 
Right, and then just the icon here on the screen, the Inspired Learning Report um, captures some of that learning from that first phase of VC, right, Mark? Um, Jamie Gamble, I think, edited this for us, and, uh, and this is downloadable from the handout section um, in the Go-To Control Panel. Hope you guys have a chance to look at this uh, after the presentation. Great. Yeah. So kind of moving forward, so, you know, cities reducing poverty now, um, which, which is the phase two of VC, um, it's undertaking a really complex evaluation still across what, what is now grown to be 45 diverse member roundtables, both in cities and regions throughout Canada. Um, and and I, I just wanted to note, too, that, you know, though the title of the network is Cities Reducing Poverty, it's not only cities uh, who, who are our members. There are smaller towns, um, remote uh, areas, um, regions even, who are, who are members of the network. Um, so in terms of, you know, in evaluating our, this diverse member network throughout the country and, the, and recognizing the fact that different members are at different phases or maturities um, in their journeys to reduce poverty, it, you know, through the place-based approach, Mark, how do we understand, like, who's using this evaluation, what are we trying to learn here, and why is it important? Yeah, thanks. Good questions, Kirsty, and, and uh, these are the questions you asked were the ones that really helped us sort through how we wanted to evaluate vibrant communities from the beginning, and it's continued on with cities reducing poverty. We're really adopting a utilization-focused approach to assessment which means there's a million things you can measure, there's a million things that people might want, but in order to make this all coherent, we have to ask who are the primary users of this assessment and what are their primary uses, what questions do they have, and then to organize the evaluation design, including the shared measurement element of that, around that. And lots of people actually don't begin with those questions and therefore they just jump into shared measurement and tools, etc., and get lost in outer space, almost like that movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock. I have that image in my mind in lots of evaluation discussions. There's no container. Our container is really asking who are the primary users and what are their primary uses. Now, this is important because this, this evaluation framework is not primarily meant to be the, uh, an evaluation framework for all of those very diverse program strategies, initiatives at the local level. And each of these cities uh, involved in this network, of course, have a huge diverse range. Each of them requires their own sort of unique and customized evaluation approach. We're not really getting into that area. What we are uh, doing is trying to create a framework where diverse communities from across the country can report in on their outcomes and their strategies in a way that uh, is roughly consistent across these diverse contexts and helps with a couple of really uh, uh, critical questions. There's three of them, actually. So here's the first one. As you know, the network agreed, everyone in the member, that there was a campaign goal to move the needle on poverty for one million Canadians. So this is crazy ambitious, and uh, we need some kind of instrument and data to help track progress towards that goal. We'll talk about how we're going to do that shortly. So that's number one. Are we making, are we making progress on the goal? Number two, uh, we are working in diverse sites, but uh, and there's a tremendous opportunity for learning, just as there was in phase one. In fact, in cities reducing poverty, it's even uh, more possible to look for patterns across the site to see if anything is emerging that we should pay attention to, patterns or themes or big outliers. So, for example, in vibrant communities, we found that some communities were generating far greater results than others. And with that data, just from this common survey, we said, let's uh, look under the hood of those communities and find out how and why, uh, w what might be the reason for that. So we did a bit of a deeper investigation, and we learned there was a combination of factors that the cumulative result was that they tended to have bigger outcomes. Uh, number one, for example, was communities that had bigger outcomes also worked with really big, ambitious targets. They said, we're swinging for the fence. We're not trying to just help people exit poverty, we're trying to reduce the number of working poor families from 60,000 to 30,000. That Those ambitious targets drove ambitious thinking. Number two, they had very diverse and high-profile leadership groups. People in multi-sectoral efforts often think we just need to get representatives from different sectors and that'll be enough, like some kind of formula. But who is brought? Their spheres of influence and how committed they are, etc. We found that that high-profile committed leadership group was the second condition. Uh, the third one was uh, an emphasis in their strategies of focusing on systemic changes. 
rather than programmatic interventions. As we know, programmatic interventions are easy to put together, but it's the systemic one that moves needles on things. And uh, that was the third feature. So simply, Kirsty, having some data that said, hey, how come some of these, look at this bell curve, some of them are really generating outcomes. We looked at the outliers, and uh, that, that gave us a sense of where to go look for a deeper investigation. And we generated insights that were cr incredibly useful for the rest of the community. So that's number two. Number one, tracking progress towards goals. Number two, uh, looking for patterns across site that might be useful for further investigation and generate insights on poverty reduction. Uh, so the third level is kind of a more of a fuzzy level. Uh, this framework may or may not be useful in its entirety to all the different diverse communities. And uh, for, just because they're dealing with such crazy diversity with, uh, with initiatives at different stages of development, but we actually think there's two ways that uh, contributing to this data at the national level for those first two purposes, which by the way, Kirsty, is good enough, right? That, mm -hmm. that well, just to achieve those two things, that, that's uh, some measure of progress. But it can also have the spin-off effect at the local level. That design and the way it's framed in the, the survey could inform local organizations about strategies or uh, ways of thinking about outcomes that might inform the development of their local strategy, if that makes sense to you, right? Simply saying, hey, we've got some good ideas. Here's how they're doing it at the national level. This may shape how we do our customized local work. That's number one. Number two, uh, if one actually gets feedback from that national survey and says, hey, listen, here's our contribution to the national work. Here's how we measure up against our colleagues. Uh, look at all, uh, look how they're making changes in the following areas. We might be more, we might be less. Look at all the different kinds of strategies that they're unfolding. Uh, some of that stuff might also be a stimulant, uh, an input into the strategic thinking at the local level. So uh, once people get these reports from the national level, they can use them productively at the local level as well. So Kirsty, those three purposes, uh, three is always uh, a nice number to work with, um, uh, and we, uh, we're feeling pretty good about that bet, that we can fulfill the promise on at least those three. Mm -hmm. Well, so we have one framework, right? Um, this, this common evaluation framework, we have a survey method that we, we send out annually to, to our cities reducing poverty members in order to collect that national data. Um, and then we have two very specific tools as well that are part of this, uh, this process that we use to help meet our goals. Um, First is that we have population, uh, population level indicators, which we purchase, purchase each year for our, our, our city members through the Canadian Council on Social Development's uh, Community Data Program. And, and then we have the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. Mark, can, for like, just to start, can you tell us a little bit more about the population level data? Yeah, so let's, uh, well, yeah, you're right. Both of these things form, form part of the framework. The first one on population level indicators, uh, I'm just going to touch on that because there is a follow-up webinar with Mike Ditter coming in uh, early December, date to be announced, about how this is being done. But let's just confirm, have a quick discussion about why it's important to have population level indicators because it does take a little bit of money. Uh, but the, uh, vi the uh, TAMRAC and Cities Reducing Poverty crew felt it important to purchase this as part of the framework's uh, benefits. Three reasons to use population level indicators. Number one, if we're in the game of moving community-wide needles in poverty, then we need to track population level changes. We simply need to do that. We can't say we're in the business of moving needles and not track something. So number one, that's just being dutiful to uh, a claim that we, uh, the, uh, our ambition around moving needles. Number two, having population level outcomes, needles in the conversation, uh, with a commitment to muse, uh, move them, infuses ambition and strategic thinking into the local group's effort. This is clearly one of the biggest learnings from Vibrant Community's first round. If you think about uh, swinging for the fence, you will swing for the fence, and you will think about different kind of strategies and, uh, uh, and um, um, targets. Let me give you a quick example. One of the Vibrant Community's cities in Western Canada had as their early uh, effort uh, a commitment to help reducing the number of working poor. In fact, I used that example a couple of moments ago to reduce poverty, and they actually didn't have targets. They had a programmatic goal of helping, let's say, with a thousand people exit poverty, and that was pretty useful. Uh, they did a lot of very useful things, and in fact, they made decent progress on that goal. But one of their early reflections, they said, "You know what? Let's look at our colleagues in St. John and Hamilton and ask why they." Their uh, their strategies are generating so much more outcomes, and it was because they were uh, 
talking about really a, a poverty a population level changes and they needed systemic interventions to achieve those. So the group in the prairies actually had a strategy discussion. They said, what if we actually talked about reducing in half the number of working poor families in the city? What would our strategies look like? Here's what happened. They moved from a number of programmatic interventions to uh, uh, visiting, uh, revisiting an idea they had earlier on in their strategy discussion, which was, could we create a workforce development pipeline which create couples together customized training that weaves together employers and uh, trainers uh, tr to create jobs that work on the city's big industrial outskirts. Can we create transportation links between the inner city where most of the folks who are working poor live so they can get to um, the um, the jobs on the outskirts of the city and what are the policy barriers and opportunities that we need to uh, address in order to make that happen. And they thought if they could just do that in three neighborhoods, they would have reduced poverty for 6,000 people. So that's the second uh, reason. Keeping population level outcomes and tracking them makes us sharper and more ambitious in our thinking. The third reason, Kirsty, if number one is uh, let, if we said we're going to move them, let's track them. Number two is it sharpens our thinking about strategy. Uh, number three is that Poverty as a in, income as a poverty level, we know that in all of our discussions, almost no one is satisfied with poverty income alone. Uh, but poverty, income poverty, particularly measured by LICO or MBM or others, is always a part of poverty. So it's a pretty good proxy indicator of progress on population level changes. And that's why the CCSD data is imperfect to be sure, but it actually is a sort of a leading indicator of poverty reduction in general that over time we could complement with other indicators, but why not start with it? Mm -hmm. Right, and certainly, and the, and the indicators were chosen by the network for the network, which I which I think is an important piece to, to kind of put out there. Absolutely, yeah. So, and then, you know, speaking to the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework, this was a key piece of the evaluation um, framework from the very beginning of VC, was my understanding. But there's been a, a, you know, a decent amount of debate as to why we're using this certain approach uh, as opposed to others like SROI. Mark, can you tell us like a little bit about, of, um, give us the background as to why this was chosen in the brief theory as to how this will help us measure multiple kinds of progress in all of these different communities who are working at different levels of maturity? Sure thing, Kirsty. And what I'll do is I'll just confirm what the uh, Sustainable Livelihoods Framework is talk a little bit about the history of its use in the first period and then why we eventually chose to employ it yet one more time. Uh, the international development, uh, sorry, the sustainable livelihoods framework is uh, taken from international development and it's been adapted in many different ways to uh, North America. Uh, we first saw it from the Canadian Women's Foundation and some excellent work done by Economos trying to adapt it to community economic development programs, particularly for women and or persons with mental uh, health uh, survivors of the mental health system, etc., and they uh, they chose it. And what what we liked it for three reasons, uh, three excellent reasons. Number one, it reframed poverty reduction in a more positive way as a process of accumulating assets in five different areas of resiliency. And they they really said poverty reduction is resiliency building. And I think they have 27 indicators in all, but that ebbs and flows. But the categories are human capital, things like training, social capital, things like peer networks, physical capital, having a house or a car, natural capital, which we know, clean water, air, etc., and financial capital, uh, income, financial assets, etc. And we, that multidimensional poverty seems to capture the complexity of poverty and the interrelationship between all these different issues. And I'll come back to that shortly. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we like it because it makes a really important distinction between programmatic interventions and systemic interventions. And the, the way they frame it is roughly as follows. Programmatic interventions help people generate, uh, gives them relatively tangible benefits immediately, but on a relatively small scale. So like a financial uh, empowerment program or an individual development account program that helps people um, uh, accumulate assets, uh, savings for some kind of purpose, buying a house, a car, or education. And those are real and those are important and we actually learn lots about the nature of poverty when we do those things because we're so close to the issue. But programmatic interventions can actually, they can help people beat the odds, but they don't change the odds for people and for that we need systemic interventions. And systemic interventions, uh, this is almost poetic, 
they reshape the, the systems that make people vulnerable in the first place. Uh, they actually help change the odds. Programmatic interventions beat the odds. Systemic interventions help change the odds. And they would say, what are the, what's happening in the systems that make people vulnerable in the first place? So if we would look at that individual development account program again, uh, financial empowerment, we would say the programmatic intervention is to create that. The systemic intervention might be uh, how, if some people are on social assistance, what, uh, can we deal with the asset stripping measures of most welfare programs or social assistance programs across the country that uh, uh, um, minimize the, the volume of assets you can accumulate before they start taking off your ever so meager income? So this it's almost like bifocals, Kirsty. You can have you can be looking at any kind of issue and be programmatic in your thinking and systemic in your thinking concurrently, and both add value in different ways. Uh, the third reason we like this is those those concepts are really broad, but they can accommodate lots of different variations of how they're played out across diverse sites. So there's so many different strategies uh, that you can use to generate financial capital. I, I won't even kind of go through them, but they're endless. So it allows for lots of variation on strategy, but some coherent and common reporting at least on, on the outcomes. So for those three reasons, we liked it. Now, Kirsty, what we want, we saw this in the very early days of Vibrant Communities Canada, but people didn't want to embrace it except for a couple because it was too complex. Uh, even though it seemed conceptually sound, we were barely on the same page around uh, what we were trying to do and how we were going to do it. So we started with some very basic income meeting basic needs definitions. But over the 10 years, as people became make more confident and we had a shared understanding of the complex nature of poverty, we eventually re returned about halfway through the project to sustainable livelihoods and we uh, embraced it uh, as the core common measurement framework across uh, the sites because of the three reasons I just gave to you. So it has a pretty good uh, tradition. It's used in a lot of places, uh, but you asked why we would use it in phase two, and we you'll you'll recount this, uh, Kirsty. We struggled with this because some people said, "Look, it's a lot of work." Particularly people who hadn't been involved in the first round and didn't, didn't realize why we chose this. <laughs> Thought of uh, reducing the number of indicators, and we had a, a couple plans to that, but the benefits of the sustainable livelihoods framework far outweighed the costs of them and the the challenge of recreating a new framework. It's well understood. It's coherent. It allows for variation. It's got that beautiful programmatic systemic intervention distinction, which allows us to track different strategies. The benefits outweigh the cost, and, and thus we chose to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and I'll just remind everyone that there's a, there's a handout that outlines this tool, the, um, the features of it and the benefits of it in uh, in the handout section there. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so you know we've you've mentioned that we can measure so many different things. We've talked about some of the things we are measuring, um, but you know, with so many, the diversity of members again, um, I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to how did we decide our, on our indicators? How did we decide what questions went into our survey? How do we know that that's applicable um, for, you know, our purposes in BC? Yeah. Well, uh, in the spirit of utilization focused evaluation, again, where the core story is how do we ensure that we create an evaluation that is not only, um, uh, you know, methodologically sound, but people use the results we uh, embraced two ideas. Number one, uh, we want it to be participatory. We wanted to ask uh, uh, folks involved in cities reducing poverty uh, through an evaluation action team, uh, ask them how they wanted to approach this, number one. And number two, we chose sort of a design approach which really is based on the idea of small bets before big bets. Some instruments and test them, prototype them, and see how well they're, uh, they're uh, employed locally, what works and what doesn't for different folks, and then keep upgrading the package before we bet big on it. We didn't really want to kind of design, build, and then launch and market. We wanted to test, adapt over time until we found something that was roughly right. There's lots of different uh, indicators in there that, uh, that look slightly different than when we started, and certainly the survey instrument uh, has evolved over time, and we're still in this prototyping phase. But Kirsty, maybe you can kind of share already we, you know, we're coming up upon some parts of the survey design that seem to work for people and other parts that don't work so well. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, Natasha, if you want to go to the next slide, here here we have a couple of things that came up in, in terms of the feedback received that we received about our survey prototype. Um, and we collected this feedback um, through telephone interviews, asking people pointed questions about what their experience in completing the survey was like. Um, you know, just an example of, of, of something that came up was, you know, why are we asking uh, a question about how many volunteers were part of your initiative this year and, and how many volunteer hours did they contribute to your, your cause? And uh, you know, this is a question that that it it's good to to look at this and, and evaluate. You know, who likes it, who doesn't like it, who is it um, useful for, and kind of how do we assess whether it should belong in the survey or not? Um, you know, f for example, we put it in there because Barber Communities has its own funders that we report to, and this is one of those specific questions that that we need to answer. Um, but of course, we want things, this to be applicable for for the local sites. Um, so there's that tension there. Um, some of the other things that came up in, in terms of the feedback was, you know, should an individual from a, a member initiative be completing the evaluation in isolation, someone who's really familiar with evaluation and, and who has the information to report on, or should this evaluation uh, survey be brought to the attention of the roundtable and a group collectively be answering uh, the questions um, to cut down on some of the subject, subjectivity that an individual might answer with um, and to make sure that we're not missing any information. Uh, since different people carry different information in their in their brains and are you know working at different levels of of the poverty reduction initiative, um, and it's also you know a question about things like trust. How do we measure trust? Um, that's one of the questions that we had in the survey, and you know we're wondering about why are we asking that question and how is it important uh, you know in poverty reduction. Um, some of the other things that came back to us, and this will be relevant for the folks who will be completing uh, you know this revised survey next year, starting uh, in January 2016. Uh, people came back to us and said it takes about an hour to 45 minutes to do our pre-interview survey um, and then our telephone interview um, in which we kind of dive into those questions or comments that you've, you've dug out, some of those outcomes that you've re um, reported on. And, uh, and so far everyone has said that the data they're collecting is fairly easy to collect. Some groups are already collecting it um, for their local initiatives, um, so that that was really good to see as well. So your early feedback and Kirsty, uh, right now it's only been so far I think a half dozen sites, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we'll be we'll be reaching out to some more folks um, to to help us with this kind of prototyping testing phase um, before we launch next year. So really important early signals uh, before one gets big. And Kirsty, we didn't chat about this, but I just recently saw um, a YouTube video, which many of the people on the line may have seen, but I just think is excellent for evaluation thinking about uh, evaluation in general and shared measurement in particular, partly because shared measurement systems uh, uh, are time intensive and can be costly in terms of, uh, on, on, on behalf of everyone's uh, uh, efforts. And, and that video is building a culture of rapid experimentation, uh, YouTube video, uh, video. And what they do is a real simple, nice look at a traditional way of designing something, which is sort of design and build, launch, market, sell, and then talk to users and see how it's going to these little quick iterations of testing before you bet big. And long story short, uh, sometimes the success rate in, in the final end uh, may not change that much, but the, the volume of investment changes dramatically. Uh, so uh, it's easier to get these things designed more quickly, more inexpensively by small bets before big bets. So I think the way the Tamarack team and the city's reducing poverty team is unfolding this nicely reflects that, that design uh, orientation to shared measurement. Mm -hmm. and I appreciate the team approach with, you know, Mark Yu being our consultant and advising us through this process as well as our, our member cities who are, who are helping us refine the survey. So, I mean, in terms of the next steps, what, how do we assess the city's reducing poverty network in terms of, you know, outcomes and, and moving forward? Well, the next step is I think we're going to do just a bit more prototyping and testing, but then we're going to do a first full iteration of the survey, meaning we may change it in the next year. Uh, we're going to generate, uh, try and expand it across all the different sites, generate as much data as we can, analyze the results of that, look for patterns, and then have a facilitated sense-making session with the city, uh, city's reducing poverty members. And by sense-making, we mean kind of asking, so what, now what? So often, uh, evaluations in general aren't used, partly because people think the act of generating data and putting them on tables is good enough and something magic 
will appear or some tremendous insight. In fact, we actually have to roll up our sleeves and make sense of the data. So what is it saying to us? What is it not saying to us? And now what, what, now what might be the implications for how we do our work? So we're going to be really deliberate about assessing, uh, making sense of it and drawing it to decisions. We're also, at that time, of course, going to do another review to say, look, on this scale, what worked well for whom and what context and why? Because uh, we know different people are going to have different experiences with that survey. We know there's going to be a lot of different storylines here. We want to understand that because we're going to have to iterate again. Uh, in all the vibrant communities, 10 years, uh, Kirsty, and you know, we were uh, that project was uh, uh, considered one of the better shared measurement uh, collective impact evaluations in North America. Uh, uh, we actually every year kept upgrading the evaluative approach. So it was never perfect. It was always being upgraded and adapted. So that, that's for sure what we'll do. Then we're going to complement that with a series of webinars and topics that might be useful around capacity building at the local level. We have the one from Dieter coming up uh, with the CCSD um, data. We'll talk about evaluating things at the systems and policy level uh, and how to really manifest the sustainable livelihood as a, a, a core framework or a complementary framework for all the cities reducing poverty sites. So there'll be a strong capacity building webinar uh, program. We're also creating some uh, tools, uh, the, t the cities reducing poverty members are, that can be used uh, above and beyond the seminars. And you've got a couple of, uh, uh, I think you may have mentioned a couple of here, Steve, but they include you know, a transportation policy framework, uh, food security policy frameworks, uh, uh, income security frameworks, uh, different ways of thinking about systems change. And all of those will be helpful for strategy, but they'll all have an evaluative component as well. So new resources to help uh, live out those principles and ideas that we talked about in the webinars. So Kirsty, there's a lot going on. Uh, this is just the opening move of the Cities Reducing Poverty Network. It, it should and it better look different uh, uh, eight or nine years from now uh, after we've got a number of cycles under our belt. But the only way to start on a complex issue is to start. Uh, and I think we've got a pretty good one here. For sure. It's absolutely an evolving evolving process um, and this has been great I mean I just dig at the history and the context in which you know where did this all come from and where are we at now um, you know I think it, it we know that evaluation is a tool for poverty reduction um, we can use it to provide the insights that we need to make strategic organizational and programmatic decisions right it's it's really integral to leading any organization program or project for change and, and collecting and sense making of data can help us in so many ways. Um, you know, our, our member initiatives, it will help them to report the progress that they're seeing in their communities and, and report to service users. And, and it'll help you communicate your successes to your funders and your donors and your key stakeholders and the community at large. Um, it can help you identify and build a case for poverty reduction and help get gain local buy-in from local leaders like city councilors, mayors, and so forth, um, business community representatives, and it can help you guide, uh, it'll guide you to reflect on gaps or spaces where you can kind of tweak or make revisions to your program or project um, just to make it more effective and to run more efficiently. Um, and, you know, and the big one is, you know, it'll indicate whether your theory of change or strategy is really working. Um, you need information to, to compare and contrast um, to know if you're right on the right path. So, you know, and from VC's perspective, it helps us understand how close we really are to reaching our goal of connecting, you know, 100, 100 Canadian communities together to, to affect the lives of 1 million Canadians who are living in poverty. So, as Mark mentioned, we're absolutely committed to supporting our members um, every step of the way in completing the evaluation process next year. Um, we will be launching it uh, in early 2016 uh, with a little bit more refinement to the tools. And, uh, and we'll be providing you with those learning um, uh, supports that Mark mentioned as well, like webinars and community practice calls just specifically around topics of evaluation. Um, one other additional thing that we're introducing into the membership for 2016 is the opportunity to connect with peer-to-peer -peer mentors and professional coaches also uh, around various topics related to poverty reduction um, but also specifically evaluation. So really looking forward to, uh, to learning more um, from our members about you know what are the gaps right now for you or challenges in, in evaluating uh, local outcomes and, and kind of how can VC support you in that. So with that, thanks, Mark. Um, let's move into our Q&A.
Um, the way we're going to facilitate this is if you have a question and you are connected to a microphone and would like to ask your question out loud, um, just raise your hand using your go to control control panel function and I'll unmute you one at a time so you can ask your question. Um, alternatively, if you are not connected to a mic, uh, we'd be happy to uh, take your question through the chat box. I can announce that out loud for Mark to respond to. Um, so uh, we've got two, two approaches here to asking questions. Um, we did ask before, you know, during the registration process, there was an opportunity for people to type in questions for Mark, and there was one in particular that stood out. So, Mark, I'm going to ask this now. Um, is the Cities Reducing Poverty evaluation process in any way, shape, or form connected to, um, you know, the provincial uh, poverty reduction strategy and its indicators? Uh, it, it may, through accident, be connected to that one, and the reason is uh, uh, it's that framework is highly tailored to the provincial strategy in Ontario, which is very relevant. And it's uh, but but that situation is mirrored across the country. So there is sort of an implicit pattern of policies and procedures here um, in Edmonton uh, with the new government here around poverty reduction. I don't know if there's a full-fledged strategy coming, but they have their own kind of way of thinking about it. Uh, um, Manitoba. Nova Scotia, every jurisdiction at the provincial level has different frameworks. And some people find this is a problem because they say, oh, all, the, um, all these frameworks, how come they can't be aligned? Well, because they're reflecting particular contexts and particular strategies. And uh, in order to be useful, they, are uh, they have to be customized to those contexts. So we didn't, pr we didn't even try to do an alignment across all those sites, partly because they're a different user at the provincial level. We thought mostly about uh, a, a community-based citywide poverty reduction effort in cities and towns across the country, so it's tailored to this one. Now, having said that, if we had mapped it out, and we probably still could, and it would be a good idea, we could find where there was alignment and variation across the cities reducing poverty framework and the other provincial ones across the country. That might be useful, but in the spirit of uh, utilization-focused evaluation, different users, different frameworks, different uses, uses that will dramatically improve the likelihood that they're used. So uh, some connection, but we but we we didn't we didn't um, explore the Ontario angle directly. Mm -hmm. um, just Elizabeth uh, had a question asking if the recording of the webinar will, will be available, and it sure will be. We are happy to send this out um, in a couple of days with uh, some related resources from the presentation. Um, so that's uh, that's the answer to your question, Elizabeth. Um, any other questions? I don't see any raised hands at this time. Oh, so Elizabeth, uh, it looks like you might have another question. Let me just go in and unmute your microphone. Elizabeth, go right ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to thank you for, for agreeing to send all these great materials out. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming to today's presentation. Any other questions? Ah, so Laura has a question, Mark. Uh, she says, thank you for the informative presentation. Can you please shed some light on how communities can prepare to handle measurement concerns that might arise from large movements in the population base over time? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning uh, where the issue of are you tracking the same people over time is a big one, such as, you know, let's use an extreme example, uh, uh, looking at demographic shifts in a city like Fort McMurray. We're just we're going go using the trap box for this one. Yeah, Laura says exactly, Mark. Yeah, yeah. You know that's a that's a good question. I don't, I don't have a good answer uh, on the top. I do think you know population level data over time does talk about general patterns and themes, but it's like uh, uh, the ocean underneath it. It can be really um, uh, churning quite a bit, and so you're wondering whether or not you're actually talking to the same people over time. I know the Annie E. Casey Foundation has dealt with this when they did the Rebuilding Communities Initiative, and uh, they, um, oh, this is a good little story, actually. Their 10-year their project, which was in 10 communities across the United States, uh, their evaluation budget was $60 million. Can you believe that? I'm going to say it again. It's not, six, it's not, not their entire program. Uh, the, the evaluation budget was $60 million. And they represent probably the best case study uh, ever of how one would deal with that, and they came up with that amount of money, came up with the same 
kind of challenges, that there, there was a lot of churn in the neighborhoods in which they were working. And they drew some preliminary conclusions about what was and was, was not possible or should be reasonable to expect in those kinds of contexts, Laura. So what I'm going to do is right after this call, uh, I'm going to see if I can locate the particular uh, study where they spoke about this. But we have someone where money wasn't really the barrier. Uh, and they have some insights about how far you can practically go with that question. So let, we'll commit to trying to find that resource for you. And again, it was from the Annie E. Casey Foundation Rebuilding Community Initiative. They have a terrific website so on lots of different issues, so do jump on theirs. But we'll see if we can uh, be surgical and find the particular study that, that answers that question. Perfect. She says, thanks, Mark. Um, so Mo has a question. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. Can you elaborate on the video you cited earlier? Uh, yeah, again, it's a YouTube video. Um, and you know what I can do, Kirsty? We'll also send this out, I guess, eh, right after this call. How, how much time do we have after this call before you send out the materials? Uh, well, usually it takes a couple of days just to get the video edited, so we could send it out early next week. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring that to you. And uh, I'm going to admit, I'm, I'm quite preoccupied right now with the the prospects of using design thinking around evaluation. And many of you uh, may have come to our Evaluating Community Impact workshops, and I'll, I'll give away one of the, 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 the secrets there. I show a video of a very tight economic development program, a micro-lending pro program, and I ask people to uh, evaluate it. And they often go crazy and come up with lots of indicators and judgments and insights and questions and tools to evaluate that program. And then I uh, confirmed that it was a fool's errand because we actually didn't know who wanted what information when, on what topic, and why. And we acknowledged there was lots of potential users and they would all want different kinds of things. And we also acknowledged that most people who use want evaluative feedback are not all that precisely clear about their question uh, and have particular ways that they like feedback and data and methods. And if we're going to improve the chances that we design evaluations that are used, it's really important to think like a designer. Who wants it? Uh, what's the highest and best use of our time? What kind of methods would be most useful to this user? And so this design thinking revolution that's going on, one always has to be cautious with these things because parts of them are, are fatty. But I think it's got some real insights about getting in the head of a user and getting uh, both you and the user testing small things before you bet big. I think it's really important for evaluation in general and extraordinarily important for shared measurement because I'm worried about people betting big on shared measurement systems where it takes years to develop, millions of dollars, and it, we might be generating data that people find may or may not be useful. So, Kirsty, with that in mind, I'll send a couple videos around design thinking in general that when you guys are watching, do think, th think try and do the translation to evaluation because they're talking about businesses and uh, organizational design, but the principles still apply to evaluation. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mark. We do have another question here from Trisha. She's asking, what tips do you have for translating a conceptual framework into something that's more tangible for community providers? Good question. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and in fact, translating a framework could also be testing the framework. So uh, all frameworks, um, I'm going to steal or uh, channel Brendan Zimmerman here, all frameworks and models reveal some part of the complex thing we're trying to deal with and they also miss or distort parts of it. So we've got a very complex thing here called poverty. The sustainable livelihood reveals some really important things about it such as multi-dimensionality uh, over time, uh, how things are interconnected, many of those um, outcomes that we want to see, etc. But it also might distort other things and you know what that means, I don't know, it'll depend on the situation. One of the ways you could do that is to take a real issue and uh, let's say you were doing a, uh, a transportation pr program or some kind of uh, comprehensive neighborhood renewal effort on a couple of blocks in a, in a vulnerable neighborhood. Take the tr sustainable livelihood framework and do a little data dress rehearsal. Say here are the kinds of things that our data might show up uh, as using this framework. Uh, what does it what does it help you see? What does it miss? What do you like about this framework and what do you don't? So use it in a real practical sense, but don't have to uh, wait for a full-fledged test. Mock stuff up. Play with it. Test it. Kick the tires. Do a stress test and, and find out to what extent, if at all, it's relevant and or how it should be adapted. 
we've done lots of that. It's not a really big art yet. I think it'll kind of emerge more if people embrace design thinking, but data dress rehearsals and simulations of evaluation tools are a great way to do early testing. Data dress rehearsals, I love it. And with that, uh, we will email you in a, in a few days, probably early next week, with links to the audio from today and, and other materials um, that Mark mentioned. And uh, we invite you to also to share your feedback. How did today go? Uh, did you learn what you were hoping to learn? Email us at tamarack at tamarackcommunity.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.